Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Tuvas, and welcome back to the Reapers. In today's video, we'll be doing a cockpit familiarization of the AV-8B Harrier by Razbam Simulations. Now please keep in mind, this is not meant to be an in-depth tutorial of the different systems that are available on the AV-8B. Instead, it is meant as kind of a high-level or general explanation for what all the different buttons and switches do in the cockpit of the Harrier. That way you can get kind of a general understanding of what the Harrier has to offer without overloading you with information on what exactly the Harrier is capable of. So without further ado, let's go ahead and walk around the cockpit of the Harrier. Okay, to kick things off, we will start on the left back panel with the DEX switch, or Digital Engine Control System switch. The DEX switch is the power switch used for the onboard computer which is used for managing your engine. So imagine yourself if you've been on, say, a 45 minute sortie or a mission, and for whatever reason you decided to go just full throttle the entire way through. Well, when you took off from the airfield, it probably had around 109% RPMs available to you, and you know, you dump all your ordnance, you have no more bombs, you are light as a feather. And when you decide to come back in for a vertical landing, you find you don't even have enough power to hover, and you start plummeting down to the planet and then ultimately crash. Well, you could blame the deck switch for that because that is the onboard computer preventing you from overstressing your engine. So if it's detected that you've overstressed your engine do during the entirety of your flight, it'll actually throttle you and prevent you from using the maximum available horsepower for the sake of preventing you from melting your engine. So it's actually a feature, so just keep that in mind. Just below that is going to be your fuel shutoff lever, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's the main lever used for bringing fuel into your engine. And just below the fuel shutoff lever is going to be your engine RPM switch, which has two positions, low and high. By default, it is set to low, and the switch is interactable, however, I don't know if it actually does anything. As far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to change any behavior in the engine, because I don't hear anything like a faster spinning engine. You can just flip the switch up and down. Next to that is the EFC, or the engine fuel control switch, which has two positions. By default, it's set to position one, and it has a second option, which is position two. Just like the engine RPM switch, it is interactable, and it does cause the master warning light to go off. However, I don't know what this switch actually does. The next one up is going to be your lift improvement devices switch, or the, your lid switch, which has two positions. It has norm and retract. If you guys don't know, the lift improvement devices can be found underneath the Harrier. So if we go to the external view, we can actually see uh, the piece that gets retracted as a result of flipping that switch. And that is this metal plate here behind the front landing gear. This metal plate here is kind of the cap of this metal plate that runs along the side of the rear landing gear. This acts as kind of a compartment or a way to trap the hot gases that get produced by the exhaust of the Harrier to prevent the hot gases from entering the intake of the engine. A lot of people think that it is meant to produce greater ground effect, but instead it's actually meant for keeping those hot gases from going back into the engine, which would then decrease the amount of thrust the Harrier is capable of providing. So if we were to go back to the cockpit and hit that switch, we can actually see that metal plate retract. And just like that, we see that retracting back into the body, and if we hit it again, You can see it extending again to form that kind of uh, cup uh, section. And just ahead of the lid switch is the oxygen switch, which has two positions, off and oxy. That should be pretty self-explanatory. That is the source of oxygen to the pilot's mask. And finally, we have the H2O dump switch, which has two positions, dump and off. I'm not actually sure what that does. Um, so unfortunately, I can't really explain too much about that, but that is indeed there. Alright, and the next panel up is going to be your external lights panel used for controlling, well, <laughs> your external lights. So first up is going to be your formation lights knob, which controls the brightness setting for your formation lights. However, this is currently not functional in the current build of this uh, Harrier. So no matter what position you set this in, it does not control the brightness level of the wingtip lights that you see there. Uh, so for now, this is not functional, but maybe this will be implemented in the future. The next switch over is going to be your position light switch, which has three settings. It has bright, dim, and off. In the off position, obviously the wingtips are now off. In the dim position, we can set that with right click. That sets it so that they are kind of in a dim mode setting where they are still visible, but not nearly as bright. Probably intended for night usage. 
And then finally you have the normal bright position setting, which makes them a little bit easier to see on the wingtips. The next uh, switch over is your anti-collision light switch. With that on, you can go to the exterior of the aircraft and see that there are two pulsating red lights on the top and bottom of the Harrier. These are your anti-collision lights. And the next one over is the external auxiliary light switch. Uh, unfortunately, I don't actually know what this switch does. I've played with it quite a bit and I've yet to find any kind of light source which would be affected by the switch. So I'm not exactly sure which, uh, which lights on the aircraft this controls. Now, there is actually one more switch which is related to all these lights, and that is essentially the external lights mode switch, or kind of like the master control switch. It has three positions. It has off, NVG for night vision goggles, and norm. In the norm position, the external lights are clearly visible from here, but if we set these to NVG for night vision goggles, the intention is that external lights on the Harrier can only be seen using NVGs or night vision goggles. And then finally, in the off position, just all lights are off on the external of the aircraft. This is kind of nice to have because you can have everything set to its max, its you know max brightness level and and on positions. But by setting this to the off position, all external lights on the Harrier are now off. Okay, and next panel up is all related to fuel. So first up is going to be your air refueling probe switch, which has three positions. It has retract or in out and then press or pressurize when it's set to the out position it is ready to begin air to air refueling when it's set to the in position it is meant for retracting the probe when you are done refueling or if you're just doing normal flights however that third position not very many people are familiar with and that is the pressurize position so if you set this up to out that extends the probe and then further sets it to pressurize uh, I don't believe this is currently modeled, and if I understand this correctly, what pressurized is meant to do is when you are finished uh, refueling from a tanker in air to air, uh, as you are disconnecting and moving away from the tanker, there is still plenty of fuel to be found inside this refueling probe all, uh, all throughout this hose. And the problem is that if you were to retract this probe while all that fuel is still found inside the hose, you'll be essentially be compressing all that fuel inside the line, which could cause it to combust. So the point of having the pressurized switch is to make it so that you can pump all that fuel inside the hose back into the tank before you retract the probe and thus prevent combustion inside the hose. So it is a very important switch. If it is modeled in the future, and if I'm understanding it correctly, that is very, <laughs> very important to know if you ever decide to air-to-air -air refuel in the Harrier, okay? Next one over is going to be your left fuel dump switch for dumping fuel out of your left tank. And likewise, you have the right fuel dump switch for dumping fuel out of the right fuel tank. Next switches up are going to be your fuel proportioner, your fuel pump left switch, and your fuel pump right switch, which should all be in the up position so that you can actually use your aircraft. All right, next area up is probably one of the more interesting parts of the cockpit of the Harrier, and that is the throttle section. So obviously you have your throttle for controlling the amount of thrust that your Harrier produces. You have your nozzle control lever for changing the angle of your nozzles so you can actually do things like hover. You also have your manual fuel switch, your rudder trim switch, and your JPTL switch, which is your jet pipe temperature limiter switch. With this by default is in the aft position or the on position. However, you can set it to the forward or off position to basically tell your onboard computer you don't care about the state of your engine, you need all available horsepower now. Now, of course, you run the risk of seizing your engine, but if you're in an emergency state, like for example, you're trying to hover and you don't have enough thrust thanks to your onboard computer, you flip that switch to the off position and you get all the horsepower you need despite having over your engine. Now, remember, this could potentially cause your engine to seize, so only do this under severe emergency situations because really, if you don't have enough thrust, you shouldn't be going in for a hover, but instead should do just a conventional landing. So just keep that in mind. Now, aside from those switches, let's go ahead and turn that back to the off position, or on position, I should say. You also have the parking brake lever, which is, well, the parking brake for the Harrier. But right next to that, when it's in the engaged position, you also have the idle cutoff, or the throttle cutoff lever. 
you pull that lever, which is unconveniently located right next to the parking brake lever, you will actually turn off your engine. So you need to be careful not to hit that by accident when you meant to actually select the parking brake lever. And the last part of the throttle area is going to be the STO or short takeoff stop lever. You use this lever to limit how far back the nozzle control lever is allowed to go. So say for example you calculate that in order to take off from the front of a carrier deck, you need to have at most 50 degrees of nozzle angle. You can use this STO stop lever to limit the nozzle position to go no greater than 50 degrees. So for example, if we push this up to about 50, we'll be able to find that you can no longer move the nozzle position past that 50 degree mark. No matter how hard you try, it will not go beyond that position. So that is what the STO stop lever is used for. Now keep in mind, if you plan on doing a vertical landing back on the aircraft carrier, you need to make sure that this is disengaged because by having that in place, you will limit the, uh, the nozzle angle of your nozzles. So if you need to do a vertical landing, you need to be able to clear that STO stop lever so you can go further back to say 83 degrees for a vertical landing. Alright, next control panel up is going to be your SAAHS panel, which I'm not exactly sure what all that stands for, but it controls uh, the SAS pitch switch, the SAS roll switch, and the SAS yaw switch. And that is, those switches are in place to prevent your aircraft from oscillating either the pitch directions, the roll directions, or the yawing directions. Because if you were to, for example, pitch up and down, and then just let your aircraft snap back into place, sometimes you'll get unwanted oscillations in the aircraft as it's trying to stabilize. So those prevent those oscillations. In addition to that, you also have your automatic flight control system or your AFC switch, which has three positions, reset, off, and AFC. When in the AFC position, it essentially automatically trims your aircraft for whatever speed you happen to be traveling at, which is very useful, for example, when you are trying to air-to-air -air refuel with the tanker. While the AFC is engaged, you can also engage your altitude hold switch, which does exactly as it says, it just holds its current altitude. You also have your Q fuel switch, which as far as I'm aware, this is not actually implemented as a system in the aircraft. In addition to all those, you also have your RPS or yaw trim switch, your landing light or taxi light switch, and also gauges to tell you what your current trim setting is for your rudder as well as aileron. Now this is kind of useful to have because if you're on the ground and you don't want to be unstabilized as you take off, this gives you an idea of where your current trip settings are, but it's kind of unfortunate that you have to lean so far just to see your current aileron trim setting because of this landing gear lever. Uh, so that's a little unfortunate. All right, next item up, with, which is something that we've already touched on a little bit already, and that is the landing gear lever. Obviously this controls the landing gear position either if it's up or down, Next to that is going to be the gear down lock override button, which I think is primarily used by ground crew for maintenance purposes. The next to that, which is a really cool button, that is the flaps built in test or built uh, bit button. You press that button, you can actually go to the exterior of the aircraft and see that the built in test is testing the functionality of the flaps, making sure that they can actually go in all the different directions they are made to go. So that is really cool that that's been implemented by, uh, by Razbam. That is really cool to see. Alright, next one over is going to be your flaps power switch, or the switch that controls the actual power to your flaps. Up from there is your flaps mode switch, which in the top position is set to cruise, where your flaps are locked in a 5 degree position. Next one down is the auto position, where the flaps will automatically adjust based on your needs at the time. So for example, if you're in a high G turn, the flaps will actually deploy uh, to a greater angle to allow greater lift and uh, kind of maneuverability. And finally, in the lowest most position is the short takeoff and landing position, where you get maximum deflection so that you get as much lift as possible at lower speeds. This is great for vertically landing on, say, an aircraft carrier. The button next to the flaps control or flaps mode switch is the emergency jettison button. You press this button if you want to get rid of the stores that are currently loaded onto your ring pylons. And just below that is your anti-skid switch. Your anti-skid switch has three positions. It has a test position, an on position, and a nose wheel steering or NWS position. Uh, when it is in the on position, you can see here on your HUD that your nose wheel is set to the cast setting, meaning that it is capable of being freely swiveled on its current axis. However, by default, you cannot actually control the nose wheel position using your rudder. 
In order to control your nose wheel steering position, or rather your nose wheel position, uh, you would have to be forced to press your nose wheel steering button on your joystick. So if I were to press that now, and then move my rudder pedals, you can see that I am now controlling the nose wheel underneath the aircraft. Next one down, if we were to set this to the off position, or the anti-skid button, or sorry, not the off position, but the NWS position, we can see that it is no longer by default set to cast, but instead is set to nose wheel steering. So even if I'm not pressing down on the nose wheel steering button on the joystick, I can still freely use the rudders to control the nose wheel of the aircraft. But in addition to that, if I were to press the nose wheel steering button, I have an additional setting, which is the nose wheel steering high setting, which offers greater control and angle of the nose wheel. So for example, if I need to do tight turns on the deck of an aircraft carrier, the high setting is what will allow me to do that because it allows greater range of motion in the nose wheel. All right, and the next switch to talk about is going to be the H2O mode switch. This is the switch used for regulating how much water is being injected into your engine. There are three positions for this switch with the top being TO for takeoff, the middle being off for no injection at all, and the bottom position for LDG or landing. The difference between landing and takeoff is how much water is being used for your engine. Because in takeoff position, it is assumed that you will be heavier because you will likely be configured to operate for your mission. So for example, you will probably have bombs on your pylons and you will have more fuel for the sake of getting you to your mission area. And of course, in landing position, it is assumed that you will have dispensed your bombs and you will have used up most of your fuel for the sake of returning back to, for example, your carrier. So in the takeoff position, you will need to be more generous with the water injection, whereas in the landing position, you will ha you don't have to be as generous as you were with the takeoff. So that is the, the, uh, the difference between these two positions. Now, below this uh, H2O mode switch is also your combat thrust button. By selecting this button, you will enable combat thrust, which will give you a little more power for the sake of combat. Uh, this should be seldom used as this does increase your jet pipe temperature if you are not careful. So try to use this only when you are in combat. And there is actually one final piece of this general left hand console side and that is the uh, landing gear lights to indicate which landing gear positions are fully down. So in this case you can see that the nose light is on the left and right wing lights are on and the main gear or rear gear light is on. This is how you know that all four gears are fully deployed. In addition, you also have what is the landing gear emergency battery lever. So if for whatever reason you do not have the electrical power needed to lower your landing gear, you would be able to pull this lever and utilize the emergency power that is dedicated to only lowering the landing gear. So obviously it's an emergency lever. I don't know if it's implemented and I've never had to use it, but well, it's there. And that is the left-hand console for the Harrier. We will now move on to the front consoles, or more specifically the left-hand side of this front console, ignoring these ODU option buttons because these are to be used in conjunction with the CDU, or sorry, the UFC button panel. So for now, we will just focus on everything below this line. All right. So first off, we have three main master mode selector switches, or buttons I should say. You have air to ground mode, which is your, which will change your HUD and optimize it for use with air to ground operations. It is a very min minimalistic HUD, so you have as much visibility on your target area as you uh, go in for your air to ground runs. You have your navigation mode button, which gives you kind of a slightly more detailed HUD for the sake of navigating to your mission area or to wherever it is you need to go, perhaps you need to RTB. And finally, you also have your VSTAL uh, master mode selector, and this gives you the maximum amount of information available on your HUD. For example, it provides not only a number for your angle of attack, but also a meter to represent your angle of attack. Likewise, it provides the same information, so not only is there a number representation of your feet per, uh, feet per minute for your vertical climb or descent, there is also a bar to represent that as well. There's other pieces of information that's not normally available, so for example, your nozzle position, your flaps position, your, in this case because the gear is down, you can see the state of your nose wheel. You also get information like your current JPT, or jet pipe temperature, you have your current RPM setting, your current ground speed indication, but I think that's available in nav mode as well. Yeah, you can see there's an S there as well. 
Uh, in nav mode, you also get a G meter readout. In nav mode, you also get what is, I think this is your Mach number, so that would make sense. And of course, your max G is allowed. But let's go back to VStall. And in addition to uh, what we've already mentioned for the VStall mode, you also get this, what looks to be kind of a slip indicator, but really what this represents is the uh, weather vane, or I actually don't think it's called a weather vane, but it represents this item here that's on the nose of your aircraft. Basically, if there is a crosswind, that will push this, uh, I really want to call it a weather vane, but uh, it pushes this wind indicator to tell you what direction the wind is coming from and that will influence the direction that this circle is on this what looks to be kind of a slip indicator. So if the wind is blowing from the right to left, that'll push this uh, kind of fatter piece over to the left, which will then direct the circle to the right, indicating that the wind is coming from the right. In addition to these master mode selector switches or buttons, there is also the flare salvo, or sorry, the launch flare salvo button, which is basically a button used to launch flares from all dispensers available all at once. Uh, so it doesn't dispense all flares at once, but one from each at a single time. So if you think a missile is about to hit you, you would hit this button for the sake of trying to distract that particular IR missile from hitting your aircraft. Because you, uh, well yeah, it's, there's a reason why it's painted in yellow and white. It's because it's kind of a last ditch effort to try to avoid a missile. Um, so below that is going to be your master arm switch for allowing you to arm your weapons and actually use them. And then to the right of all this is of course your MFD. This is your main one of your two main screens for uh, looking at different parts or systems of your aircraft. For example, you can take a look at your RWR using this MFD. You can also look at your HSI or heading indicator. You can also look at your uh, forward-looking IR display or your FLIR. You can look at your stores management page and among other things. So. I'm not going to go into much more detail than that because there are still other systems that have not been implemented yet, so I'm just going to leave it at that for now and save it for another video. Okay, so for now let's just go ahead and leave this on the RWR and move down to the armament uh, control panel. So this is what you use for controlling different elements of your armaments that will be stored on your wing pylons. So for example, if you have GBU-12s or Mark 82s, you can set the kind of drop mode that is going to be used for those bombs. So for example, AUT or auto is the same as saying CCRP. CIP is the same as saying CCIP. DSL, which I think, it, if I'm not mistaken, uh, mistaken, stands for depressed sight line, but I'm not exactly sure what that actually means, as I've never used it. And finally, there is DIR or direct control mode, which, for example, if you're using a Maverick, you are directly controlling the Maverick on the MFD as opposed to using this armament control panel and then it flips back over to uh, auto or CCRP. Next over you have the different fusing controls. You can't do anything with it right now because I don't have any bombs currently selected, but the different fusing modes are that would be listed would be safe, would be the default mode, which when set to norm is what it would default to in the case of say GBU-12s or Mark 82s. You also have the option of rotating this clockwise to the nose tail uh, fusing selection, which we'll update here as well or only choosing the nose or only choosing the tail fusing options, which also would also reflect in this uh, box here. Next over, you can set the quantity of bombs you want to drop at a single pickle release. In this case, you only want to drop one bomb on a single pylon at zero interval because there isn't multiple bombs being selected. However, if you wanted to drop two bombs, you would be able to set this to two and drop two from a single pylon at, say, for example, an interval of 0, 1, 0 milliseconds. However, if you want to drop this from multiple pylons, you could set the multi option to two. And in this case, you'll actually be dropping a total of four bombs. Two bombs on two pylons equals four at an interval of 10, uh, 0, 1, 0 milliseconds between each bomb release. So that is to give you a rough breakdown on all these different options on this armament control panel. Now on the bottom half, you have your jettison mode selector. You have several options available, uh, a total of five actually. You have your station selector, your store selector, your safe mode, your combat, and fuel to explain each when you have fuel selected and then you press jettison. Uh, what will happen is this will only select the fuel tanks that are on your pylons and jettison those. So say, for example, you have used up all your fuel on your uh, fuel tanks, you can just simply use that to just own the fuel tanks. 
If you were to rotate this to the combat selection, you would drop all stores that are not related to air-to-air -air combat, so you would only keep any AIM-9s. In the safe position, you will not be able to use the jettison stores button because there, uh, it would be in the safe position, so you don't accidentally jettison things you don't want to jettison. In the store position setting, you would be able to select one pylon, and if there happens to be other uh, weapons of the same type on a corresponding uh, opposite side pylon, it will select those as well, and then you could hit jettison to, to jettison both sets of weapons, or the entire set of weapons. And then finally, the STA, or Station Select, will allow you to select individual stations and only drop the ones that you select when you press the Jettison button. And finally, you have the IR Cool, or otherwise known as the Ground IR Cool Switch. This is meant for activating the IR Cool functionality of, say, the Seeker Heads of your AIM 9s. This is currently not implemented, but this is what this control switch would actually do. Okay, with the left front console taken care of, we can now focus on the center front console, starting with the HUD or heads-up display, which we've already discussed, so we don't have to go into much more depth other than what we've already said. Down below the HUD is the UFC or upfront control panel, which contains a number of um, caution and warning lights, for example, the master caution, master warning, a number of different advisory or warning lights here, as well as here, and a bunch of different buttons and knobs that we can use to interact with the UFC. Uh, for example, we can use this to interact with the IFF, the TACAM, the all-weather landing system, and also, for example, the radio communications 1 and 2. Down below the UFC is also the HUD control panel, where we can select options like the HUD symbology reject uh, switch, the HUD off or brightness control, meaning you can turn the HUD on or off using this rotary knob, the day, auto, and night switch for the HUD display mode, HUD Video Brightness Control, HUD Video Contrast Control, and finally the type of altimeter that is being shown on the HUD. You have two options, you have Barometric and Radar. If you look at the HUD right now, we can see we currently have Radar selected because it is indicated by the R. If we set this to Barometric, we see there is no longer R, and the number being displayed is now based on the more classical uh, barometric pressure uh, instrument here on the bottom right. So if you were to change this to, to, some, to some other settings, so say like 50, you can see that that gets reflected here on the top right. And of course we can always set this back to radar, so it's now based off the radar that's on the aircraft. And speaking of more classical instruments, we also have other items here that will commonly be found on other aircraft because these are not unique to just the Harrier. For example, this here is the navigation core setting knob, however, I don't think this is actually implemented because no matter how much I mess with this button, or this knob, I don't see anything updating in the core setting for the HSI, so maybe this isn't actually functional. In addition to that, you also, you also have the airspeed indicator in knots, you have the backup ADI, or the attitude indicator here. As we can see, we are currently about 5 degrees up from the horizon, which we can more or less see using this as well. Uh, we also have the angle of attack indicator, we have the vertical speed indicator, as we mentioned earlier we also have the barometric altimeter, and down below we also have, I think, is the slip indicator. And from here we get on to Harrier specific controls, so for example, we have the on and off switch for the FLIR, we have the video recorder system mode switch, with the video recorder system display selector switch, we have the DMT toggle on and off, which is the control for the DMT. Uh, the dual processor mode selector switch, the probe heat mode switch, the mission computer mode switch, and finally the INS mode knob. Out of all these buttons and knob, the only ones that are actually functional or even just somewhat functional is the FLIR, the DMT, and the INS mode knob. None of these switches are actually functional, so just keep that in mind. Now that we've covered the center front console, let's move on to the right front console. Now please keep in mind, I will not be going into much detail about the MFD because we've already covered it here. There are some minor differences uh, with regards to the sensor select button, but they are more or less capable of displaying all the same information. So instead, we'll focus on more unique characteristics of the right front console. So for example, we have our engine indication panel which gives us different pieces of information with relation to our engine that is pretty important to know about. So for example, we have our duct PSI information, we have our current RPM percentage, because unless we are in 
VTOL, or sorry, VSTOL mode, we actually do not know how much of our RPMs we are currently using. So if we don't have VSTOL mode selected, this number here is not actually being shown. So for example, if we are in nav mode, that number is no longer available. So we will have to rely on this guy here to make sure we are not over throttling our engine whenever we're in forward flight. In addition to that, we also have our fuel flow indicator, our JPTR or our jet pipe temperature. This is very useful for knowing it so we know how much we are overstressing our engine. If this number is too high, like in the 700s, we know we are really, really pushing our engine. So this is a very valuable number. This is our current uh, vertical stabilizer trim position. So for example, if I trim the nose down, that number will decrease and go into a downward facing arrow to represent the fact that the vertical stabilizer is trimmed down by one degree uh, because of the trim button. To the right of that is the water flow indicator. This lights up whenever water is being injected into the engine. And finally, the uh, amount of water that is left over in our aircraft. In this case, we have 500 pounds of water left over. To the right of all this is the nozzle degree position. So if I were to rotate my nozzle to forward, that uh, kind of dial rotates up this way. And if I bring the nozzles back, it rotates back in this direction. I find it interesting that the numbers go as high as 100 and 120, even though the Harrier is only capable of having a nozzle position of 99. So I'm curious if other Harriers could actually rotate their nozzles further back to as much as 120. Okay, and finally you have the EDP brightness control setting, which changes the brightness level of the lights that will be shown on this display. Okay. And that is the engine indicator panel. Next up on the right front console is also your RWR power and volume button. So this is what turns on the RWR as well as increases or decreases the volume of the RWR. In order to turn it on, you move it from the off position to the on position, and then you rotate it further clockwise by right clicking on it to increase the volume of the RWR. Next one down is the decoy dispenser control. This is basically your flares and chaff uh, control switch. You rotate this clockwise from the off position to auto to dispense flares or chaff from their respective positions, depending on which button you press. Or you can manually select up to only dispense from the upward facing uh, dispensers, or you can select down to only dispense from the downward uh, facing dispensers. Additionally, there is also an RWR option. For example, if your RWR picks up a missile launch, which is a radar guided launch, I haven't actually used it yet, but I'm guessing it will automatically display, uh, dispense flares and chaff if it detects a missile heading in your direction on the R uh, RWR. And then further down is your jammer control. It starts off in the off position, then you rotate, rotate it clockwise by right clicking, and you can set it to standby to built in test to receive or to repeat mode. Uh, I'm assuming that stands for repeat. But this assumes you have a DECM pod mounted to the underside of your aircraft. All right, and moving on, you now also have your fuel indicator. This is how much fuel you have left in your aircraft. All right, now with the center console discussed, we can move on to the right console. So starting off, we can see our current hydraulic pressure readouts. So if we were to press on the brakes, we can see that the hydraulic pressure drops from 300 to 275, indicating that the hydraulic pressure from the brakes are actually working. Down below that looks to be some kind of PSI indicator, which uh, looks like it just tells us, it looks like it says accumulator, but I'm not entirely sure what this is supposed to represent. But this is our PSI readout. This right here is our warning panel for all the different warning lights that could potentially uh, come up in our aircraft. Uh, so for example, if you try using the jammer without having a jamming pod installed, you will get a couple warning lights here on the bottom right showing you that you are attempting to use a jammer when it is not actually installed. So you see two warning lights for E and I think CW and it says no go, meaning that you will not be able to use those jamming frequencies. All right, and moving on from the warning lights panel, we can see that there is a voltage meter for the battery. There is a DC test standby and main, which I'm not actually sure what that does. I don't think that has any functionality. So let's go ahead and set that back to, to its default position. We also have the battery switch, the generator switch, the engine startup switch, as well as the APU generator switch. 
And then now we have a whole block of items which I don't believe are at all implemented in the Harrier. Uh, for example, the VHF UHF radio controller. Although you can interact with it, you can set it's off the test to transmit receive plus ground to transmit receive. No matter what setting you choose, I don't believe that actually affects the aircraft in any way. So, although you can play with it, it doesn't actually do anything with regards to the aircraft functionality. Uh, likewise, the AC and IP control panel, I don't believe is functional. I've never had to use it. The ground, uh, sorry, the ICS ground volume, or sorry, the ICS ground control, which I believe is used for communicating with the ground crew while your canopy is closed. I've never had to use that either, so I'm not sure if that's actually implemented at all. Uh, similarly, the IFF controls, I don't think these are implemented at all either. But for actual stuff that are implemented, uh, one of which I don't think is, which is the annunciator lights, I'm not sure what this actually controls. I've played with this a bit, and I'm not sure what this actually changes, at least somewhere around the cockpit, I'll have to do some research. However, what is functional is the console lights, so if we were to turn this up, you can actually increase the, the backlight of each of the text on the left and right consoles. You can also do the same for the front console, which is the instrument lights, so everything is now backlit. And we can also turn up the floodlights, which are these guys here. In addition to that, you also have a working compass light, so the compass is right here, the auxiliary compass. If we were to flip that switch, that is now back, well, lit up as well. We can also turn it off, it turns back off. And that pretty much covers all the functional items in the Harrier. Nothing else appears to be interactable. Uh, there are some switches back here, which have to do with the ground power settings, but none of those are functional at the moment. And yeah, that is basically the cockpit walk around of the Harrier. So guys, please let me know what you thought of the video. If you have any questions, make sure to post in the comment section below and keep in mind, this was kind of just a general overview of the cockpit of the Harrier. Hopefully this answered some questions you might have had. Hopefully you found it interesting, but please do let us know in the comments below what you thought and we'll do what we can to improve in, on future videos. Until then guys, have a nice day.